you don't like history, that's fine. You don't have to watch this video. This isn't on the test. But if you want to learn a little bit, stick around. Excellent, you're still with me. So just to share a few of my thoughts here, I don't really care about memorizing the facts. So it wouldn't make sense to ask you a test question about dates or you know who invented what, but I do enjoy understanding where things came from. It just gives you a better perspective of where we are today by understanding how it evolved. So that's why we're gonna look at the history. And as a tip moving forward, don't try to memorize the facts. Yes, your exam, it, or your midterms too, they will be open book. So it's not really about memorization, it's about understanding everything as a whole. So just to give you a couple resources in case you are interested in learning a little bit more, I own this book over here and I do recommend it, but maybe an easier source is to go to this website. So Gary Sustak has put together a remarkable resource, timelines, all kinds of interesting facts. Uh, things that you can download and just take a look at. So I'm going to cover some of these things. A lot of what we were presenting today did come from this website. But why don't we back up quite a bit? So this is like over 200 years ago, uh, around the early 1800s. And we're talking about John Dalton, who is credited with atomic theory. So that's the idea that if you're kind of chopping something down, the smallest you can get, the point where you're still saying that this stuff is still stuff, is an atom, right? Um, so the, he considered that an atom was like an indestructible particle. There was no way you could go any smaller than that. And if you look at his diagrams here that sort of describes uh, how different compounds are put together, the idea was almost like Lego blocks. There was no molecular theory. There was no bonding, bond angles, that kind of stuff. But it did make sense when you look at the combination of elements. So for example, this, this law of multiple proportions here says that you can only combine elements in certain ratios. And by ratios, we're talking by mass here. But of course, mass, moles, it's all going to be the same. So atomic theory certainly did go a long way towards advancing our understanding of science, but it wasn't without its flaws. So for example, the idea that atoms can't be destroyed, they can't be broken down into smaller particles, we know this to be false. And Mary Curie here was credited with that discovery for, for her, her discovery of radiation. She was also the first to enrich uh, elements radium and polonium. And you can see the, uh, the watch face there that's painted with radium that allows it to basically glow in the dark. This isn't something that we do today because radium is highly toxic, but at the time it was kind of an interesting little toy, although people did get sick, you know, like the people who had to paint the radium onto the watch face. The 1800s was also a great time to be playing around with electricity. So a cathode ray tube is actually just a hollow tube. There's nothing inside of it. And if you connect a a power supply to it, not actually a battery, but a power supply, and, and you run a current through it, you'll find this kind of glowing phenomenon. Now, actually, the glowing phenomenon comes from the electron beam that's hitting a phosphorescent screen, but you will see that to, to happen. And you can see here that if you apply an external field like a magnet, you can actually bend that or, or push that, that electron beam from one side to the other. Now again, let's go back in time here. So at the time, they didn't even understand that this was an electron beam. The question at the time was whether the, the, the ray that was passing through was a wave or, or what, whether it was particles. J.J. Thompson was quite fascinated with these cathode ray tubes, and he did a little experiment with them. So the idea here is to turn on or off a voltage, and you can see that it deflects the beam by a certain distance. So by understanding how much voltage you apply, and knowing the angle that it pushes that field, you can actually calculate the mass of the particles that are involved. J.J. Thompson was the first to discover that these rays were actually particles, and he called the beams electrons. Now, cathode ray tubes have actually been a part of modern day technology for quite some time. I doubt that anybody's actually looking at this video on one of those old school, you know, big fat monitors, a CRT monitor, so a cathode ray tube monitor, but that's exactly how they work. So you have an electron beam where you turn on or off a voltage and you can direct that beam onto a phosphor screen, which is the screen that you're looking at, and that causes it to glow, the red, the blue, you know, the, the different pixels. And over here in the middle, we have a scanning electron microscope, which we also use to control the beam of electrons as they pass down into very small particles uh, the picture that you're seeing over there is actually an image of pollen. And we know today that electrons carry a negative charge, and that was also understood because they originate from the cathode, travel towards the anode. So if we have a beam that's negatively charged, the question becomes, can you do the same experiment but with positive rays? And that's what you're seeing over here. 
So this is a positive ray tube, or an anode tube, where the electron beam is moving down the center, so this is space right over here, but at the same time it, it kind of carries a ray towards the other end. The top end of that tube is filled with a gas, and for whatever reason it's causing a glow as well. So this is proof that we have positive rays being traversed as well. So working with these anode ray tubes, J.J. Thompson was able to develop the image that you see here. And believe it or not, this is what we would describe as the very first mass spectrum. I know it doesn't look anything like the mass spectra that we saw in the previous video, but nonetheless, it's showing the separation of charged particles that were carried in a, in a vacuum. So let's take a closer look over here, especially at these lines for neon. So you notice that the neon line, rather than just having a single band, there's a couple. There's this little shoulder band for the, the mass corresponding to neon 22. And that was quite a significant discovery because at the time, atoms were just considered to be one single atom. Yes, radioactivity was understood, but it was assumed that only radioactive compounds would, would exist in different forms. So take a look at what J.J. Thompson wrote. So what he basically said was that neon was not just one gas of, composed of one atom, but a mixture of two different kinds of atoms, one with an atomic weight of 20 and the other at a mass of 22. And that carries into the periodic table. So when you think about the atomic weight of neon, it's not exactly 20 or 22, it's some weighted average in between. So it, it takes account all the different isotopes and the ratios that they're existing at to come up with a kind of an average between them. Now, unfortunately, J.J. Thompson wasn't even able to observe the neon-21 isotope. It's both at a very low abundance, and his spectrographs didn't quite have the resolution to be able to distinguish these masses because they're too close together. But it was actually J.J. Thompson's predecessor, Francis Aston, who was able to build a better mass spectrometer. And yes, literally, he built the mass spectrometer. At the time, to, do, to make up an instrument like this, you had to be a master glass blower, you had to be able to, to create vacuum pumps. Everything was handmade. So with the device that you see here, Aston basically went through the periodic table and he discovered isotope after isotope. He basically characterized everything that was available to him. Now that's all fine, but mass spectrometry can be used for a lot more than just characterizing single atoms. So when you think about molecular analysis, mass spectrometry over the years moved into larger molecules, uh, became a big boom in terms of analyzing petroleum compounds, especially with the development of new instruments like GC mass spectrometry. But there's all kinds of other almost weird ways that mass spectrometry can be used. So over there you have the Shroud of Turin, so mass spectrometry can actually be used to date samples based on carbon isotope ratios. That's a whole topic onto itself. It's not a regular mass spectrometer that does that. And one of the most fascinating stories that I find is that mass spectrometry was actually used to purify compound. And not just a little bit of it, we're talking like a very large quantity. So that image over there refers to one, one small segment of a gigantic mass spectrometer that would fill up like a gymnasium, and it was used to purify uranium. The story isn't exactly positive, it was used to purify uranium, which is what went into the first atomic bomb. Nonetheless, it still just goes to show some of the weird uses of mass spectrometry. And finally, as we push ourselves into more recent times, I guess it's been since like the late 1980s, the mass spectrometry became dominantly used in, for example, the pharmaceutical in industry, biological characterization, environmental analysis, and this comes from the fact that uh, these types of molecules were not easily ionized and put into the gas phase, but now we have new tools, better mass spectrometers, so when it comes to doing molecular characterization, you can almost always guarantee that mass spectrometry is involved in some way. So basically, as we go through the semester, we'll fill in the gaps here. I'll talk to you about how the different kinds of machines that were used uh, to make these discoveries, uh, ionization sources, mass analyzers, things of that nature, and then you'll be able to understand how we can use them for all these different applications. So I guess that's about it for history. Uh, we'll see you in the next one.